Suppose you are parents who have spent years raising a bright, attractive, and promising child. Then, just when your child's adult life is beginning, somewhere between the ages of 17 and 25, their personality changes. Oh yeah, um, I'm really, I'm really scared about this thing. I'm a frightened little girl, I'm scared. In a matter of months, the child you knew is lost forever into a world of delusions and hallucinations. I think those bats and the witch and Cliff were um, really my father, but the tin man wouldn't let me date my father. <laughs> Too big, you know. He never really stopped me, but... Uh... You seek out the best doctors you can find and are told that your once healthy child now has an incurable brain disease. You learn that he may never recover from the illness. Doctors can't even tell you what causes it. Some people like killing hamburgers, and some people like killing sodas, and some people like killing other people. Some people like killing eyes. It's a cruel life sentence of missed opportunities and lost hopes and dreams. It is a mysterious and frightening disease. It is schizophrenia. It is madness. Most schizophrenics don't live in hospitals or on the streets. They live with their families. Bob is 35 years old and has been sick for 17 years. He's lived at home with his parents in West Virginia for most of that time. Bob's been diagnosed an acute schizophrenic, needing intensive care. One out of every 100 people in the United States will be diagnosed with schizophrenia during their lifetime. It can strike anyone. Uh, Phil the Grill made me a steak dinner once, but they didn't do anything to him. Schizophrenia does not mean Bob has multiple personalities. He has a physical disease of the brain. Nice day out, huh? Yeah, beautiful. Spring is going to be here pretty soon. Yeah. You like being outside? Uh-huh. Beautiful day. Think we'll get a little snow? So, Bob, this, mm -hmm. this is your room, mm -hmm. huh? Can you tell me about some of the things you have in the room? Chair is from, um... the, uh, St. Elizabeth Union Mission and from the Spencer Mental State Hospital where I rocked for six months, two years and six months respectively. Uh, this is a new bike. Dad tried to sway my uh, eyes when I was depressed. Tried to put a bike in here so we could get some life, you know. And uh, this is a radio cigarette case and the holder in the um, ashtray and this is a TV. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me about the trophies? Are those things you won? I uh, was an excellent bowler and a Latin scholar in high school and college. This uh, I got from Nelson Burton Jr., an average of 195 in bowling. This was from the Forensic League. Um, seal of approval. Bob was once the captain of his high school's debating team. He now experiences extreme thought disorder and talks in a disconnected jumble of words. I know how to angle myself with the rest of the men, do you see? That's why I did that to Sue, that's why I did that to Aunt Bethel, you know. And uh, I want Fritz and all of them to know, the praying mantis and the spider and the grasshopper, to know that uh, I think it's very important that we act badly, but I think it's very important that we act 
uh, uh, in reality of what makes the world go round. You know, you're liable to go sliding off the curb into your death uh, on a man that can't control himself. So really, the in this wins, uh, whether it's no or yes. So um, I think bulk sometimes wins in some of the cases. You know, the very agile cases, the bulk wins. But I think the most important thing uh, the uh, the devil can do is to court is to uh, self-sacrifice and coordinate the Kmart walk so pleasure can be evened out. And in, in fact, I've I've really swayed my charms towards um, going forward into straighthood. But uh, I think uh, every doctor knows if there's no such thing to believe in straighthood. And to go ahead forward uh, into kidney stones and stuff like that, you know, Dad, uh, Dad's a son of a bitch. <laughs> but um, Bob, do you know how long it's, you've been sick? About uh, a year. Just recently? No, it's been about a year and two months. Bob doesn't realize he's been sick for 17 years. Could you give us a, a little bit of a description of what Bob was like as he was growing up? Yes, uh, Bob was a very serious person from the first day he was born. We thought surely he was happy. He had just about everything. We spent a lot of time with him, and we loved him very much. This was our first child, and we had... Uh, uh, a lot of hopes and expectations of Bob, because he was a very smart fella, and his coordination was great in sports. He, he liked government uh, affairs, he liked politics and the like. Uh, and they say he excelled in math. He had four years of math in high school. He accepted the responsibilities of his homework on his own and did a bang-up job. He was an all-American boy. On the advice of a a private psychiatrist, he said that he felt like he needed... In the beginning of Bob's illness, doctors advised his parents to commit their son to a state institution. Bob's mother talks about why she decided instead to take care of Bob at home. He was in that state hospital for six months. And uh, it was... Uh, it, it was just terrible to see uh, what happened to him. And when I saw him, I couldn't believe that this could happen to this, this kid that had been such a great kid. He, he was skin, he was so thin, he could hardly keep his shoes on. He shuffled, he could hardly walk. And he was just so drugged, um, you just had to take him by his hand, you know, and lead him. And he was that bad off. Like a little puppy or something. It was terrible. And I said to Cappy, I'll see this child dead before I'll ever let anybody do anything like this to him again. And we brought him home. She won't have to have a second piece now. Bob, would you, do you want to return thanks for us this evening? Okay. Our dear precious London down man, we pray that you will please forgive the sins of the states and take us to the Sylvania dinner. We pray that you will bless our loved ones for hearing and seeing and smelling purposes. We pray that you will also let us go east and we ask these things and Christ, uh, the Messiah's name, and for his sake. Amen. Okay. After dinner, Bob's mother, Frankie, talked about her son's childhood and how he first got sick. It is. Bob's was a typical case. Schizophrenia struck him at age 18, during his first year of college. And it came on suddenly. It was, uh, uh, it, he was in college, and we really, uh, didn't recognize it. He came home at Thanksgiving, his first semester in college, and he was nervous, but we figured, you know, it's just college. And uh, then when he came home at Christmas, he was kind of pacing and walking the floor, and we 
still didn't recognize anything, just thought he was eager to get back to school. And by mid-semester exams in um, January, he, he was calling home uh, two and three times a week a little before that. And then he got to where he was calling home uh, two or three times a day and then four and five times a day and then in the middle of the night he'd call and talk an hour always to be a reassured reassured and we could not understand this we just didn't know what was happening and finally on thursday before his final exam started on the following monday he called and he said mom mom my mind is going i'm losing my mind Are there some things you'd like to do? Yeah. What would you like to do? Most of anything. I'd like to, I was going to say screw more. <laughs> um, be with the cowardly lion. In the following September, he was hospitalized for the first time. In a pro he was in a private hospital, and he was in there for about five weeks. And that's when they started giving him Haldol. And then we uh, saw the reports at the plant where my husband works, and that's when we found out what he had was through the insurance papers. And on there it said acute schizophrenia. And we, we didn't even know what schizophrenia was. Well, of course, now we know it is a disease, but back in those days, we didn't know this. And uh, that's very hard on the parents when they learn, uh, when you have a doctor telling you because of something you did that that child is ill, and it's not true. Is, uh... Scientists and doctors do not know what causes schizophrenia. Is an encephalogram. There are several theories for the onset of the illness. Schizophrenia often runs in families, and it may be inherited genetically. Yet, as in Bob's case, there is no history of mental illness on either side of the family. Uh, I think those bats and the witch and Cliff were um, really my father, but the tin man wouldn't let me date my father. Too big, you know. Some scientists believe in biochemical theories, that there is something wrong in the metabolism of the brain. So, uh... I think the monkeys and the men are mixed. Some doctors believe that viruses attack the brain, possibly during the pregnancy. Abnormalities in a person's immune system, developmental theories of early brain damage, even stress theories in which a person goes mad because he cannot cope with the pressures of his life. But all of these are just theories. Schizophrenia is not curable because no one really understands what causes the illness. I think we need to fly over the Atlantic Ocean. That's what we need, yeah. You feel more like doing something? Oh, yeah. Medicine? Yeah. Bob's father, Cappy, decided to retire early to devote more time to his son's care. But uh, I think uh, as time goes on, it's smart to lay off medicine. You don't like to take the pills? You think you could ever get much better if you don't take medicine? It just depends on how I could hit the, the golf ball. One of Bob's symptoms is a need to walk to release his excess energy. Bob once walked out the door of his home in West Virginia and was found by the police several days later. He had walked all the way to New Jersey. And so every day, three times a day, Cappy drives his son to a shopping mall. The Kmart is Bob's favorite place to go. Walking, or are you? You know, I, I just, I just love to shop. Don't let us hold you up. 
<laughs> As Bob walks, he constantly hears imaginary voices, perhaps the most dramatic symptom of schizophrenia. He hears these voices as clearly as he hears the voices of real people talking to him. Are you going to still stay around here? Want some hot chocolate? Bob can't control or stop these voices, which always torment and criticize him. So how are you feeling, Bob? I just had to claim life. <laughs> What's that? Had to claim life. Claim life? Yeah. What do you mean by that? You said there was that I have never been a man in my life, therefore I have to oh, claim no, life. Oh, I didn't yeah. say that. Oh, okay. I wouldn't say that. Okay. You'll be a man. You'll be a man someday. Bob is one of the 40% of schizophrenics that don't respond to any drug treatment. He's been given Thorazine, Stelazine, Haldol, Moban, Loxetane, Prolixin, Melaril, and Navane. But none of these antipsychotic drugs have made Bob any better. Oh, Bob is about to start taking an experimental new drug called clozapine. It's considered a last hope medication for schizophrenics who have failed to improve on all other drugs. But there is some risk in taking clozapine. The medication can, in some cases, have dangerous and even fatal side effects. We want it to work so badly, but yet you always have to remember it may not help Bob, it may not help Bob, or he might develop the side effect and not be able to take the medication. If he can just be happy and have, uh, have a, an attitude of just wanting to do something or wanting to go to school or, or even being able to watch television or, uh, just be better than he is, you know. This is just a wasted life. It's not only wasting his life, it's wasting ours. It's... I, I don't know. I just have a feeling about this one thing that it's going to help. It's got to help. We can't imagine waking up in the morning and uh, <laughs> not having this sick kid. I just can't imagine what it would be like. So... We are really looking forward to it. It's hope. It's a lot of hope. And Bob didn't get better. His thinking started to improve, but he had a bad reaction to clozapine and had to stop taking it. Bob lost his balance and coordination, and today cannot stand up or walk. After struggling with the illness for 17 years, Bob's mother and father finally decided to commit their son to a small group home, where Bob will receive the intensive care he needs. The dream of most families with schizophrenics is to see their child living independently in a nice setting. The Buddy Farm is such a place, tucked away in the quiet countryside of Northern California. Here at this old farmhouse live eight young men and women with schizophrenia. They each have their own room, help with the household chores, and work part-time in a nearby ranch. They can stay as long as they like. The Buddy Farm was started by the mother of this young man who suffers from chronic schizophrenia. He and the others who live here must be able to function in a group setting and all must still take their medication. A newcomer to the group is Missy. I sleep here every night. <laughs> One thing, I decorated my own room. It's my own Missy is 27 years old and has been ill since age 15. Have you always been able to have a room of your own in the places you've been? 
Yeah, I've had a room, not of my own, not all the time, but I've had, I've had a room. Most of the time I've had a room that was mine, really mine, my room. I did. Well, how are you doing here? Um, fine. Missy's been in and out of hospitals, boarding care homes, and at times homeless on the streets for the past 12 years. I'm doing fine. I'm getting, I'm getting, I got better before I got here. My doctor told me I was totally well. So I was, I was totally well. So when I was totally well, it means I'm through the doctors or with everything on medication. And he just says, I'm well, and you're straight on the book. And so I said I was. And how do you like this place so far? Um, yeah, fine. Fine. Mm -hmm. Have you also been in places like hospitals and, and giant kind of um, institutions and things? I've been to those, too. Mm -hmm. what, what were they like? Well, the ones I were in, what it was like was that I was mostly locked up in a little timeout cell room. They locked me up there every second, and I would be in a locked up ward, and they'd shut the doors on me, and they'd lock them all up, and I can't go anywhere, and... And, uh, and the other thing is that they would send me to the toilet cell everywhere I went. You know, it was just stupid. Mm -hmm. Do you know why they locked you up? The place where they locked me up was a mental hospital. I had to go to a mental institution because I had problems. Mm -hmm. I just had to go there because I had problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to get rid of your problems so you go to a place like that. Mm -hmm. Did you, do you think you got rid of them? Yeah. So you're feeling better? Mm-hmm. So do you have to take medication? No, these are the stupidest questions. I am not answering any of these questions. Every time you ask them, I'm not answering them. Because I don't have an answer for them. I'm not answering them correctly. Sorry, that's the end of that question, story, whatever. I mean, I, these are not questions I can answer. This is the stupidest questions I've ever heard. They are nonsense questions. You can't ask a nonsense question. You have to ask a regular question. She was a beautiful baby. She, she was precious. She won all the baby contests and... Missy's mother, Kelly, remembers her daughter growing up. ...tell me how precious she was, so I'd enter and she'd just win. And she just had a normal, happy childhood. She was a beautiful child and she loved to dance and she was a singer. She knew the words to every song and, and then in junior high, we were in Houston and she was elected cheerleader. I just knew that she was going to go to proms, have dates, do everything that all her friends were doing. And that's when she was just one day perfect, and the next day, it seemed overnight, in a period of weeks, she was gone and never saw her friends again. And they never knew what happened, really, to her. It was real sad. She stayed up all night crying and sobbing and and her language was out of touch. She was bizarre, talking bizarre. And so I took her into the medical center. And when he saw her, he uh, said that he felt like she was out of touch with reality. But to think that my daughter had schizophrenia, it was just, I couldn't believe it. It was a total shock to me. It was just so frightening. I, I didn't know what to do. and And I... It was more disbelief than anything. I, I wouldn't accept it. But we knew that she probably had schizophrenia because she heard voices. I know that Missy has, has probably always heard the voices. She is um, still hearing voices. And the medications don't seem to work on her that well. Later, we tried talking to Missy again. She wanted to show us her new dog, Jasper. Got him at the SPCA, and he was he was about um, seventeen dollars for him, or twenty five or thirty two or forty two, something like that, seventy two or something like that, maybe eighty. And he's a he's a prize dog. He's he's got beagle and hound dog in him. He's a pretty little thing. Want to watch him catch a ball? Sure. Hey, give me the ball, Jasper. Give me the ball. Go get it, Jasper. Go get it. Go get it, Jasper. Go get it. Go get that ball. Bring it to mommy, bring it to mommy, bring it to mommy, bring it to mommy. He won't bring it to mommy. <laughs> he won't do that. 
When I took Mom on my vacations, I smoked cigarettes. With my mom on me, we smoked cigarettes. I mean, I smoked cigarettes. I smoked cigarettes, lots and lots of cigarettes. And I went on the sun, laid on the sun, got a super big black tan. And it was hot down there, and I just smoked cigarettes. I smoked cigarettes, I really did. I smoked a lot of them. And that was when we went to Acapulco. Missy is expecting visitors, her mother, father, and brother. The first to arrive are her father, Eddie, and her younger brother, Kyle. I like your hair. Yeah, I'd rolled it. It didn't look so great. It looked better this morning. Her family has not been together like this for many years. You look good. You look like thanks, you're... Thanks. you're how many Missy's mother and father were divorced when she was five years old, long before she became ill. It's not often that both her parents visit her at the same time. There's nothing to do, no, there's nothing to do. There's nothing to do. Here, here you just sit around and smoke a cigarette. That's all you do. Here you do. So that's just the rules, and you know, this is how the rules go. I don't do anything, Cobb, but just sit around and smoke cigarettes. Her father has come to see Missy's new home. You think it, you know, this, this happens to somebody else. It's really not happening to you or your child. Uh, but... You know, it's hard to even think. You don't uh, think. You just kind of die a little bit, I guess, as you, and you don't know what to do. That's the real problem, I think, that I find so many times. Sometimes she's, she's not quite as bad as she is in others. Sometimes she uh, has no change. It just... Uh, and that's, I think that's the best way to put it. Most of the time, there's no change. Sometimes it's a little worse than others. Was there a time at all that you tried having Melissa at home? Yes, uh, about the second year she had this problem, we took her into our present home, which we have, I have two other children by a second marriage. And uh, Melissa moved into it. My wife, uh, presently, did a tremendous job trying to cope with the situation and, and it's a it's a tremendous burden on someone it's that it's their child and but when it's someone that isn't their child but we had her for about a year and very truthfully it was a real problem in my family with her being there almost uh, causing a divorce in the second marriage with all the problems but in fact it came to a point that we really didn't know what to do with this and and it probably saved my marriage when she ran off. Well, I'm wrapping up Missy's packages for her birthday. She's going to be 28 years old. And um, she wants to have a little party. So I thought I would do that for her. But birthdays were always real important to Missy. Since her family is rarely together like this, Missy wants a party and has announced that it is her birthday. Balloons and streamers and we all... It's not really her birthday, but everyone acts as if it is. And, um, so as she was growing up, she got used to that, and then when she became ill, uh, she has spent the last 13 years in the hospital on her birthday, and that's been real sad, and so... I thought it would be nice because her dad was here and her brother that we could do this for her. We're, we're going to sing happy birthday to you, okay? Yeah. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Missy. Happy birthday to you. Okay. All right. Many more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. This one's from you? Yep. This is cute. This is cute. See? Tell everybody. See? See? Ah, uh, this is nice. I need some. I needed some sun perfume. I'm gonna put some on me. Spray me. I think I spray on you. No. Me. Okay, just no, not you. Okay, boy, you're gonna smell it good, Missy. No. What kind is it? Charlie. Charlie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. It's always getting it pretty tough. There. Missy's younger brother, Kyle, remembers their growing up together. She was my play partner for, for 12 years. And uh, she was my best friend, and she was my big sister. That's something that uh, no one can ever take away from me. And that's really what I remember about her the most, is those years. Uh, she got sick after uh, the disease took over her life. Uh, it seemed that a you know, it was a terrifying experience because it was, it was no longer the Melissa I, Missy, the Missy I used to know. It was a new Missy. It was just real difficult for me to understand. I couldn't, there was, no one could explain it to me at the time because there were times when she was so normal and then there were times that she, I didn't know her and that I just didn't, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to talk about it. I, I didn't want people to know. I didn't want to admit to people that I had a sister because it was, it was an embarrassment and it seemed like no one had the right answers for the disease. It's unfortunate that she is sick because I think she would have been a really uh, dynamic person. She's very, she would have gone out and got anything. And I look, I guess that's one of the saddest things of all is <clears throat> is knowing that she's not going to get, is knowing that she's not going to have a life for herself and she won't ever have a family. She won't have half the things that a lot of people do have. Yeah. I'm sure glad I got to see you. That's good. Do you like all your stuff? Yeah. You got some good stuff. Mm -hmm. It's great to have your dad and your brother here, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. You see me a lot, don't you? Mm -hmm. You get tired of seeing me? Mm -hmm. Hello, we'll, we'll get them up here and see you more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, Jasper. No, you don't. Look at Jasper getting in a picture. Come here, Jasper. Come here. Through. <laughs> she looks happy. That's the, you know. I think the the best thing about it is all we can do is provide for her living, just where she's where she's happy and the surroundings are good for her. She's only been here a short time. She's only been here a couple months. She right. might even get better. Right. That's what we're hoping, definitely. She seems to be on a, only on one strong drug at this time, which is very good. She just, the rest of it are all vitamins, which are very encouraging. OK, shall we go? Y'all ready? Mother, are we gonna, are we gonna, mother, are we gonna see about going into Waterford and getting my stuff in my room? Hmm? Are we gonna go into Waterford and get my stuff in my room? We've already done that. Yeah, no, she's, she's gonna get some things, just to posters okay. and things. No, I wasn't gonna get that. I was gonna get three almanacs, four posters, two plants. Okay. Um. Sounds good. Two plants, okay. uh, a, a plaque, all this stuff I have to get. Do you, are we gonna go into town and get all that stuff, mother? Yeah. We're going to go into town tonight and get all this mm -hmm. stuff from so, me. So, Eddie, I think your daddy was going to do that for, mother, for, never for your mind. birthday. Never mind. Let's not do it. So, I'm going to let you, I think I'll let you and your dad go. Because we... Okay, mother, let's not do it. All right, let's go. Come We're on. not going to do it. Let's go. Come I on. think we could at least stop by the horse's house and tell them we're going to get the horse. But we're not going to get all this stuff in my room. I said, would you stop by the horse's house and get the, the horse? After everyone had left, Missy talked to us about her years of struggling with schizophrenia. Oh, it's cold. I'm not, I don't ever get mad. I'm not mad right now, you know. I don't, I'm not mad right now, you know. And for the rest of my life, I'm just going to be sitting in a chair, you know. I will. For the rest of my life, I'll be sitting in a chair. Won't that be fun? Hmm? Yeah, won't that be fun? Yeah. 
I don't think it will be fun. I think it's going to be a bummer. A real bummer. And, uh... You know... Schizophrenia is a very hard thing to live with, though, y'all. I mean, schizophrenia is a very hard thing to live with. I don't think they have any schizophrenia in this world. You know, to tell you the truth, I don't think they have any. But schizophrenia is a very hard thing to live with. I may have it, too. It's hard for me, too. It's really hard on me, you know. But schizophrenia is a very hard thing to live with because it's, you've got a chemical imbalance, and it goes straight across your head, see? And it just really pops here and pops here. And that's the way it is. And I'm going to take this because I know about it. But you know what? I hope I don't have it. I really do. So I'm, I'm, just, really, I'm just really blessed by God. I hope to God I am. What I'm saying is, I don't, you know, I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm, I know, I know what it is, you know, but how could that happen to me? How could that happen to me, huh? How could that happen to me? How did I get in that mess? How did I get in that mess? It must have gone cuckoo, huh? Roland and Stephen, a father and a son at a baseball game on a Sunday afternoon. Today is one of Stephen's frequent outings with his parents from the Rockland Psychiatric Center, where he lives. Stephen is 28 years old and is one of the many victims of schizophrenia who require long-term institutional care. had a shutout. That, that dropped ball out there. That ball could have been caught, I think. For most of the 10 years he's been sick, been Stephen was withdrawn and spoke very little. I don't know. When, when the With the help of the new medication, Stephen is beginning to talk again. There he is. Couldn't be hot. And then the butt moved the guy to third, remember? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was, that was a good play. play. Yeah. Were you laughing at that, or we, did you just get a voice? I was just laughing for some odd reason. Yeah, no, that was a funny play. That was a, a normal voice. But sometimes you do just laugh because you get those funny voices, right? Right? Right. Right. Ten. Eleven. Come on. 12, 13, 14, that a boy. Okay, feel that muscle. Stephen visits Dr. William Sachs, a research scientist at the Nathan Klein oh. Institute. Stephen is part of an experimental drug treatment you know program what, to reduce his hallucinations and delusions. Pull up a chair. He is given Diamox and vitamin B1, along with his antipsychotic medication in an effort to correct enzyme deficiencies okay. that may impair normal brain metabolism. You want to answer some questions for me? Are you feeling sad at all, Stephen? Down in the dump, sad, depressed? Hmm? Right now, you feel sad? No, I feel fine. Like food, food okay. digestion. Are you angry at anybody? No, I'm not angry at anybody. You think anybody's out to harm you? To do yeah. you in? No. Do you have any special, extraordinary powers, like Superman powers? Uh. Can you do things ordinary people can't do? Can I Can you do exceptional things ordinary people can't do? 
Yeah. Yeah, like what? Beat a baseball bat into the head of a gentleman. <laughs> to beat a baseball bat into the head of a gentleman is an example of the violent thoughts that are a major symptom of Stephen's schizophrenia. Although most schizophrenics are not dangerous, some, like Stephen, can have occasional violent episodes. For the most part, his antipsychotic medications control Stephen's feelings of anger and hostility. And he was, he was a really... Stephen's mother, Janet, remembers her son growing up. Um, so he had, you know, a lot of uh, normal, healthy experiences throughout his, his growing up years. Absolutely nothing that would have given us a clue or made us think that anything was, was wrong, that there was any kind of mental problems, mental illness. He was adorable. He had been coached even before Little League by my husband. I think the minute he was old enough to put a mitt on and catch a ball, he started being coached by Roland. When he was about eight or nine, uh, baseball was his main interest. And he went into the Little League and really was very involved in that. It was a big thing where we lived. In high school, he again, he was, was popular. He was a really good student and into athletics, and he's good at listening to people. And, you know, just was a together kid. And the first time that we saw anything really unusual was at this time toward the second, the end of the second semester in college, where he was just looking different and losing his train of thought, getting a little spacey, lying around the grass, not attending classes. And then the d d kind of a depression set in, and uh, his eyes looked real uh, kind of glassy and kind of, you know, spacey, and, and as though he, w he wasn't there with you. And he wasn't. I mean, he was starting to not purposely withdraw. He wasn't withdrawing socially. He was, something was happening to his, his brain, to his system, that he wasn't normal anymore. And uh, we were getting real worried. Within a period of several months, Stephen's behavior changed dramatically. He started to hear imaginary voices. He lost touch with reality. He became suspicious and frightened and began acting out violently. Stephen's violent behavior led to his first hospitalization, an eventual diagnosis as a schizophrenic. I, I didn't know what schizophrenia was, but I, I knew it was something terrible. And um, that my child should have such a, a horrid disease um, overwhelmed me. I felt like I got hit over the head with a baseball bat. I broke down and cried like a baby. Over the years, Stephen has attacked his doctors, hospital staff, and his father, Roland. Roland describes one such recent incident. One day before going into work for a dress rehearsal, I decided to leave a little early and stop by the hospital and just take a look at him myself. When I got there, he was in the ward office uh, with his doctor. The nurse was there. And they closed this very small office. They closed the door behind me, and I uh, leaned over to him. I brought him a couple of magazines. I had brought sports magazines he likes. I said, Steve, I brought a couple of magazines for you here. You know, here they are, and, you know, how are you feeling? And then all of a sudden, he, he gave one of these funny smiles on his face, and then his expression changed completely. And he got up and he started swinging at me again, full force. Only, unlike the first time, this time he connected. He hit me several times in the head, right in the center. I went flat on my back. And it was a very horrifying experience. Um, I since learned from my daughter, who works uh, at the Napa State Hospital in California, that I handled myself pretty good. That I put a leg up at him, not to kick him, but just to try to keep him away from me. And, but he's very big and strong, and he managed to get my leg out of the way. And kind of, I scrambled to my feet, and I drove my shoulder into him. I tried to. I thought at least if I could get my head behind him under his armpit, uh, he threw me down to the floor again. And by this time, though, some help had arrived, came into the room, and he calmed down for a minute, and they let him out of the room, and I was not, fortunately, seriously hurt.
in any way. I looked a mess. I had a big egg in the center of my heart. I was I had some cuts, but they were superficial. I feel no scars. Some people like killing hamburgers, and some people like killing sodas, and some people like killing other people. Some people like killing eyes. His parents have placed Stephen in 22 different hospitals, trying to make him better. Although Roland was attacked by Stephen just two months ago, he continues to take his son out of the hospital on weekend day passes. It's been 10 years now. And through the vast majority of that time, he's been very flat, non-responsive for the better part of the last time. Well, he's had moments. 10 years. And yeah. Here we are. This is Steve's building here on the left. He's up on the second floor. See that patient with a I gave that jacket to the hospital. I gave him a bunch of clothes. You see that blue check dress? <laughs> jacket. I'm not supposed to go in here at all. I guess I went in the wrong way. Building 18. So I'll get him as quickly as I can, huh? Okay. Okay. You keep my show, Steve. Today, they're going to West Point to play ball with each other, as they've done through the years. Would you like your radio on, huh? your station? There we go. The rock station? Is that all right? All right. Here we go up to West Point. It ought to be a lot of fun today. It's great to be playing baseball again with you, Steve. Beautiful. Although Stephen is clinically labeled very low functioning, he is able to throw and catch the baseball with ease. The Army team's the pride and dream of every heart in gray. The Army line you'll ever find is fighting in the fray. And when the team is fighting for the black and gray and gold, we're always near in song and cheer. This is the story we're told of the army team. Ba bum ba bum ra ra ra. Sing on, brave old army team. On to the fray. Fight on to victory. For that's the fearless army way. Ba -bum -ba -bum. Schizophrenia is a cruel illness. One of the saddest things about Stephen is that he can't remember the good things or past accomplishments that happened in his life. You used to throw so hard that not only I couldn't catch you, but when you tried out for the Babe Ruth League, the team manager tried to catch you and he couldn't do it. He called the team catcher over. <laughs> do you remember that? No, I don't remember. Yeah, that was 14 years ago in Elmsford, so it would be hard to remember. I never became a pitcher. You became a pitcher in Little League. You were one of the starting pitchers in a very good Little League. Uh, and there were a couple of Major League coaches there that felt you had the goods to make it to the Major Leagues, I remember. The tail was fun. Down the ball was fun. And it always, there's always pain at the times. When sometimes it's pleasure, sometimes it's pain. It and just today, depends. And today's a good day? Today's a good day. Show us that knuckle ball. That really used to dance. I used to be afraid when you'd throw that thing, would hop around like a butterfly.
For Stephen, schizophrenia has meant 10 long years of torment and agony. And he suffers from one of the most terrifying symptoms of the illness, the flattening of his emotions. He feels nothing. He can't experience pleasure. It's as if something in his will has eroded. Do you feel better now that you're on this medication? Uh, yes. Is there anything you, um, would like to do? Um... Fighting dirty? That's based on having to live over on that ward, isn't it? Yes, it's based on trying to live on that ward. Well, you, you must be doing okay. You've been there. How long have you been there? Three weeks. No, 17 months. 17 months. Do you think you'll ever be able to uh, leave? No, I don't think I'll be able to leave. If he doesn't get any better, um, we'll continue to try and be the best parents that we can. We've been trying to accept the fact that he has a chronic illness. We're trying to live with it and continue to have a relationship with our son the best that we can. Uh, I think we do have the best possible relationship that a parent could have under the circumstances. You know, he's still our kid and we love him a lot. Janet and her son are quietly celebrating a year and a half of no violent episodes since Stephen started his new drug treatment program. Hey, great man! Great! We're gonna learn to dance if it's the last thing we do. Maybe I should have saved those leftover dreams Funny, here's that rainy day. Here's that rainy day they told me about. And I laughed at the thought that it might turn out this way. Where's the one I wish that I threw aside? And it's funny how love becomes a cold rainy day Funny that rainy day is here There are two and a half million people in the United States with schizophrenia. Of these, one-third show significant improvement under medication. The incidence of violence among schizophrenics is no different from that of the general population. For further information about schizophrenia or the nearest support group, contact National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, P.O. Box NAMI, Arlington, Virginia, 22216.